Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you for working your magic at the keyboard once again for us. Welcome to another mini meditation and music service. We would like to acknowledge that the land of which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We've left our Christmas tree up for this service as a reminder of the wonderful light that came into our world. And we have placed the banner of hope back on the pulpit as a reminder of the hope that light brings. And at this time, I would like to say our thank yous to Karen Hill for her meditation, to Alan once again for working his magic at the keyboard, to Patty and Hilda for leading our singing today, and to Kurt for being our videographer, and of course to Lisa on sound, and Lisa puts all of these videos together for us and keeps us on track. Thank you so much, Lisa. Dear Lord, we come before you to ask for the restoration and healing of our minds and bodies Thank you that you became fully human and walked among us so you understand the complexities of our human being. So I lay these challenges before the cross. I surrender now to your grace knowing that you have paid the price for my freedom. Come Holy Spirit, bring the torch of new balance, correction and well-being to my thought life. Come into the memories of my past and the confusion of my present and with new hope, hope and future of breaking free from any illness into a new dawn. Lord, right now we trust in the power of your unfailing love and grace and the freedom that is found in you. Come release me into all the good things that you have in store for us and come and release us into all the good things. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And our theme today is mental health. Let's begin our service with our opening hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, verses 1, 4, and 5. Most of you know me from Humanity United Church. I've been a member for a number of years, and I'm also the daughter of Catherine and Fraser McPhee. What you may not know about me is that I am an educator and a child and family therapist. So I've been working with children and youth um, who struggle with either behavioral challenges or mental health struggles for the past 25 years. And in that time, I have learned several different um, approaches, worked under psychologists and psychiatrists, 
um, who have taught me different ways of um, helping children and youth. Um, and in the last couple of years, I was introduced to a, an approach called the Nurtured Heart Approach. And after several years of experience and using and trying different approaches, um, I um, decided that the Nurtured Heart Approach is the one that I believe is the most effective and helpful for families and children who are struggling, who are intense, who have a different level of intensity in this world. So last year, I decided, right before COVID, I decided to become a trainer in the approach. And so now I offer uh, trainings to children and families in the Nurture Heart approach uh, so that they can face world, the world, their lives challenges um, more successfully. So today I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Nurtured Heart approach in the hopes that it might be something that sheds light onto a different way of interacting and um, seeing um, the relationships in your life. So to start, the Nurtured Heart approach was created by Howard Glasser and he was an intense individual himself. And so one of the things I love about the approach is that it was created by somebody who gets it, somebody who was an out of the box child in school, somebody who struggled to, and was told that there was something wrong with him um, most of his life. And so the approach was born out of his reflections on his interactions with teachers and parents and other adults who made him feel um, that maybe there was something wrong with him. And so um, his, his main idea in the Nurtured Heart approach is that in order for any of us, children in particular, obviously when we're developing, but any of us to be successful in life, we have to be strong on the inside. And so he calls that inner wealth in the approach. And so the approach is entirely about building inner wealth, making the people around you see their greatness. And so the approach is built on three stands, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But first I'll start with explaining inner wealth in sort of, with sort of an analogy. So the analogy that Howard Glasser created, which I love, is that if you think of an artist who um, creates masterpieces, they get to decide what, of, which of their masterpieces they put into their portfolio. And a portfolio is supposed to be something that an artist showcases to the world as their absolute pride and joy, the things that they are most proud of. And how, the way Howard Glasser describes this, which is lovely, is that we actually are all walking around with a portfolio of experience all the time, right? So our inner wealth is like this, this suitcase full of life's experiences, things that people have said, experiences we have had, the way that we have been made to feel. And what we know about individuals who are struggling either with mental health or other issues is that we are generally more apt to remember the things we did wrong. And we put into the portfolio the things that we are um, ashamed of. And we see ourselves as somebody who um, is not good enough. And so, and this is an unfortunate thing about humanity about who we are and in particular for individuals who are more intense they tend to are they tend to be drawn more to the things that they've done wrong and that becomes what goes into the portfolio and so the whole idea behind the nurtured heart approach is to help rewind that undo that a little bit we know that we can't take things out of a portfolio of experience but what we do with the approach is we relentlessly try to reinform that individual about what they should be putting into their portfolio and we try to change that value they hold for themselves and so we do that through the three stands. so now I'm going to talk about the three stands so the reason that the approach is created with the three stands and the word stand is involved is because um, the idea behind taking a stand is that when you take a stand you're not being wishy-washy you're being very clear and concise and resolute about what you're doing. And so stand one of the Nurtured Heart Approach is all about, ab it's called absolutely no. And it's about, I refuse to give energy, connection or relationship to the things that are going wrong, the things that I don't want to see more of. Um, so with children, if there is, um, what children learn very easily and very naturally in life is that generally speaking, 
adults around them come alive when they do something wrong. And when things are going right, we're very quiet and boring. So if you think about a group of, you know, if you have toddlers um, playing, if they're playing nicely, the adults are usually very content and happy. And in our minds, we're thinking, oh, I'm so proud of them. They're doing so well. But we generally don't stop them to say, do you know how lovely you're playing right now? Do you know that you're being good friends? Do you know that you are looking after each other and you're sharing and you're being kind? And I see you doing all of those things. We generally don't do that. What we do is we watch nicely and as soon as something goes wrong, that's when the adults have to come in. So if one child steals a toy from another or somebody starts to cry or get upset or somebody pushes somebody else. So kids learn very early in life that they get the most connection and attention when things are going wrong. And this isn't, this isn't, the approach does not try to say that this is a, you know, um, fault. There's no blame. There's nobody being blamed for this. This is just human nature. It just makes sense, right? And that's fine generally for a lot of children, that's fine because doing well is comes naturally to a lot of kids. But when you're talking about people who struggle and people who have a greater intensity and don't necessarily get recognized often enough for the things that they're doing right, um, but get tons of recognition for what they're doing wrong, then you can start to see how problems are created. And this is where the kids that struggle in our systems and families who struggle with particular children, this is where when, when this is sort of pointed out to them as something that we do, it makes a lot of sense. You start to see how a kid who struggles and generally doesn't have a lot of skill or ability to do well easily in life, that when they start to get so much connection from adults for the mistakes that they make, that just becomes something that starts to feel good. And it just becomes sort of a... Uh, a reinforcement that they are no longer in control of. And so the idea behind the approach is we've got to stop doing that. We have to stop connecting with kids, in particular intense kids, for the things that they've done wrong. And instead, stand two, which is absolutely yes, um, we have to relentlessly come in with our energy and connection for everything we see the child doing correctly. And so... As per my example, we would remind ourselves in the quiet moments that it's our job as the adult to go over and talk to the child about what they're doing right. So you would take all of those, that blank space. So one of my favorite slides in the training of the approach is a, is a big white slide with one purple dot in the middle. And you say to the participants in the training, what do you see? And of course, most of the time, everybody, not most of the time, all of the time, everybody sees the purple dot. And the point of the nurtured heart approach is that what we're missing is all the white space. And this is where the approach for me just kind of is not just about an approach we should use on children. When I think about the world around us, the news today, adults that I work with who suffer with mental health issues, um, I see nurtured heart as an approach that we really need in our adult interactions, in our workplaces, in our businesses. If everybody could recognize that we spend way more of our energy and time telling people what they've done wrong um, and that we really would have better connection, better, um, better workers, better employees, better relationships if people were constantly told what they're doing right and that we see them doing that thing right, um, that everybody would do better. Everybody would feel better and everybody would connect better. Um, so that's sort of that stand one and stand two. So it's, so the nurtured heart approach is very much like a three legged stool. Um, I haven't talked, talk, talked about stand three yet, but the first two legs of the stool are this balance, this dance of making sure that you're giving lots of energy and connection to all of the things people are doing right. Even the little things, so they call it baby steps. Like, so if you do have a child that's struggling, um, I work in a classroom with kids who have really struggled in our system, as an example. And so when I'm using the Nurtured Heart approach, the minute the students get out of the van in the morning and come and look at me, the first recognition is, look at you here at school today. Wow, it's 8.30 in the morning, you're up, you're dressed, you're at school, you're so responsible. 
You know, that's the kind of noticing that we don't usually make for our students. And then they walk through the front doors of the school and they might greet somebody in the hallway and I might quietly turn and say, wow, you really made that person's day by greeting them so respectfully. You're a respectful student. And it just carries on from there. And we're talking about students who generally their life in school has been about, oh, don't, don't talk in the hallways. Sit down. Don't touch that. Stop that. Right. Stop blurting out. No swearing. No this. No that. So they, they are very, at first when I start working with students with this approach, it's, it's, a, it's a tough switch for them because they are not used to being seen for the things. They almost don't trust it. They're not used to being seen for the things they do right. And families I've worked with, um, some of the some of the couples I've worked with, has, you know, have taken this into their workplaces. And the feedback that I've gotten and other trainers of the approach have gotten is that that is a general consensus. That's not just the response that you get from children that you're using this approach with. You get that from adults. When adults start to be seen in the workplace for all the things that they're doing right, when somebody, you know, your boss or a coworker comes up just to stop you for a moment and tell you you know, how great it was and how much they appreciated something that you did. Um, it's very transform transformative because I think what with this approach brings an awareness of how much we are drawn to noticing the things that are going wrong. And our news and media feeds into that and so many things about our world today feed into that. And so I really believe that the Nurtured Heart approach is at the root of a big change that we need to make in terms of where we focus our energy and how we interact with each other. Finally, stand three is called absolutely clear. So we have stand one, absolutely no, no energy to negativity, no energy to the things we don't want to see happening. Stand two, absolutely yes, relentless energy to the things that we want more of, the things that are great about the people around us. And stand three, absolutely clear. And I love absolutely clear. And when I mentioned at the beginning of the this uh, little video about how I've used so many different approaches over the years. Um, the thing I love the most about the Nurtured, approach, nurtured Heart approach is how strict it is. It sounds, uh, the name of the approach makes it sound so gentle and fluffy, um, but actually it is the strictest approach that I've ever uh, worked with. And what's good about that is that kids who struggle need clear, concise rules. They need clarity and this approach brings that and so absolutely clear um, is your is your rules it's the things that you the expectations you want followed and this approach teaches us that we in any relationship we need clear established expectations for there to be success so whether that's a student teacher relationship whether that's a, a couple relationship or romantic relationship friendship um, when expectations are clear and then people are recognized for following expectations, which is stand two, um, that's where the magic happens. But you can't recognize a rule that's not established. So you can't tell somebody they're doing a good job if the job you ask them to do isn't clear. And so the Nurtured Heart approach really hones in on how and has really shed light for me on how unclear most of the rules in our society are and how much clarity we need to bring. And that's all about communication. And so uh, stand three really helps. And stand three, the analogy used when we're training the stand three is um, they use a sports analogy. And so they'll talk about like the game of basketball and say, you know, a lot of intense individuals who don't do well in school or in their jobs can do very well in sport. And when you think about it in sport, the rules of the game are crystal clear. Both the players and the officials know them without doubt. And when a rule is broken, the exact same consequence applies every single time. And the consequence is quick and easy. And the consequence is such that it propels the people to want to be back in the game. So that is what the Nurtured Heart approach is based on. It's about based about creating clear rules that are enforced every single time they are broken with a very clear and quick consequence. It's not punitive, it's not energetic. It's meant to create an environment where being in the game, the game of life, in the, in the in, in, when we're talking nurtured heart, but with the analogy of sport, being in the game is where people wanna be. And when you can create an environment that people want to be in, 
You don't need strict consequences. You don't need harsh consequences. You don't need punitive measures because being in the game is so rich and rewarding that people want to be there. And so the reset, the consequence, it's called a reset in the nurture heart approach, can be anything. It can be quick and it can be anything because the true beauty of the approach is that the child wants to be back in the game. And just very quickly before I finish, I'll give an example of that. So in my classroom, when students are in the program, like I mentioned before, they are getting constant recognition for what they're doing right. So from, from the, the hallway where they're recognized for walking quietly and responsibly to sitting down at the table where I'm telling them how wonderful it is to have them there and noticing all of the things in the moment that they're doing. Um, when the child is in that environment and something goes wrong, let's say they make a mistake, like they say a swear word or they turn and say something unkind to one of their peers, uh, I will say reset. They will know that that means to stop and they have a choice. They can apologize. They can, they can leave the table quickly and do something and come back. But they know that when I say the word reset, it means that they've broken a rule and I don't need to restate the rule. I don't need to say, you just were rude to him. Do you know? Because we've already through stand three made the rule crystal clear that in this classroom, we are kind to one another. And so all I have to say is reset then my job as the person using the nurtured heart approach is to spend that time after the time that I said reset, looking for the moment the child decides to do the right thing. So as soon as I see re say reset, if I see that that child stops themselves and turns to the peer that they were being rude towards and says something kind, I immediately come in with my energy and connection. Look at you, you made a mistake. You fixed it right away, you apologized, you showed, I can tell by how quickly you corrected that, that you care, you wanna be a part of this classroom community, you are responsible. And so there isn't a lot of punishment in that. It's all about being back in the game. And it's very transformative. And it's very transformative for people who are struggling with what's in that portfolio and seeing themselves as the unkind, unwell, uh, not wanted, not belonging individual. It, it becomes about connection and relationship. So it's a very powerful approach. I hope um, this little tidbit, this little intro to the approach gives you a little bit of a sense and feel free. I'm gonna um, put the uh, website at the bottom so that you can check it out, check out more. And if you're interested in trainings, um, there is a wonderful friend of mine here who introduced me to the approach, Carolyn McGuire. Um, and her partner Christina who have a business and run trainings uh, all the time and so you can find out more and their link is at the bottom as well so thank you for listening forgive us Lord for the times we failed to lift our eyes first to you for the days we've forgotten to even come before you fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit today and your strength your peace your joy Fill us with your spiritual wisdom and discernment and the constant reminders that your presence will go with us and you will give us rest. We ask for your healing over every part of our lives, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. We ask that you would make us strong and resilient for the days ahead. We know that you have great purpose for those who believe in your name. Help us not to allow the distractions and the struggles of our days weary us down to the point of exhaustion. We know that your desire is for us to live a life abundantly and free. Thank you. Thank you that you are greater than anything we face here, and our desire is to reflect your love and light to a world that is so desperately needs your hope. Thank you for the victories in our lives that have no explanation except God did this, we give you the glory and honor for all that you're doing every day, even in the times that we can't see it at all or fully understand your ways. Help us to keep our eyes on you and off of our circumstance. Help us to see when another soul needs to be encouraged too. May we be faithful to carry one another's burdens, remembering that we're all in this together. We love you, Lord, and we need you today. We're reminded of our weakness, but we know that in you, we are strong. We lift up our hearts and our hands to worship you. 
Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you that you surround us like a shield. We choose to find rest in you today. This in Jesus' name. Amen. And please join us for our closing hymn, Like a Healing Stream, followed by a postlude by Ellen.